All right. Thank you for joining the Not Your Broker Blueprint sponsored by BitGet. This is an exciting conversation today. As always, none of this conversation is financial advice. Please do not take it as such. Also in the description, we'll have a referral link. Any of the trading fees generated from that referral link, I'll use to buy back and burn kin. So excited about that. Uh, and yeah, in the studio, we got Tanner here. Welcome. Hey. Good to see you again. Good to see you. This is the first live pod you've done for Kin, right? First time I've done one live. We've been doing a bunch of the remote ones over Zoom and Google Meet, but this is uh, this is nice. Being the real in, deal. In, in the studio. In the studio. So thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, why don't we hop in? Uh, just give us the overview of what why Kin was created and what shaped that journey and, and give the people kind of where we got to today. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a fun story. Um, yeah, where, where do I start? So I'll go back, uh, founding of kick messenger. Yeah. So Ted, who's the founder CEO of code, the company that, uh, I'm a part of now, uh, which is a wallet app, uh, built on the Solana blockchain and uses kin as the underlying currency. Uh, prior to that, we found, helped found and launch uh, the cryptocurrency Kin, which I'll talk about. But even prior to that, which is what led to the insight to initially launch Kin in 2017, was birthed out of uh, a lot of insights we had building Kick Messenger. Um, so Ted started Kick in 2009. It was right around the time that smartphones were starting to become uh, the dominant computing platform for most consumers. Uh, the iPhone came out in 2007. Android, I think, had been out for a little bit, was really just starting to gain popularity around that time. Uh, Ted, at the time, was working at BlackBerry. He was a, a UW engineering student, did a bunch of co-ops at BlackBerry, was getting ready to go work there full-time, and had this insight that everyone's starting to get these smartphones, uh, iPhones, Androids. We should take BBM cross-platform. And uh, as a story, which I used Kick, by the way, it was awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll, I'll jump ahead in a second to when I first started using Kick, and then what got me uh, to Kick. Uh, so Ted um, was working at BlackBerry, had this insight that uh, chat was going to be a dominant part of the uh, mobile experience, and everyone's starting to get these smartphones. So I had this insight: okay, why don't we take BBM cross-platform? BlackBerry didn't want to do that, but his boss at the time said, you know what, you're really good at building products. You should go uh, start your own. So Ted uh, does that, starts uh, Kick. At the time, uh, it was actually called Unsynced. It was a music sharing platform with chat built in, and then eventually uh, chat became the uh, the dominant form factor of the app. Uh, but the, uh, the punchline is they launched Kick in 2010, right around the end of 2010, I think it was October, and it went viral. Went zero to a million users in 15 days, million to two million in seven days. It was the fastest growing app in the App Store at the time. Everyone was talking about it. Uh, and uh, the thing that made Kick popular was you had this constrained experience of SMS where you had 140 characters. If you want to send a message to someone, uh, it was um, a very basic experience. You didn't really have rich media. You, were, you had a small amount of characters you could use. And then if you, wa you wanted to send a message to someone on a different carrier, it was slow as an, and it was expensive. If you wanted to send a message to someone in another part of the world, it was, it was even more disjunctive, slower, more expensive. It was uh, a terrible experience. I remember at the time uh, I had an iPhone 1, but... I wasn't really using it for uh, much messaging with uh, people that weren't uh, on the iPhone. So the um, kick basically went over the top on SMS where people could uh, download kick. It was all username based and you could send a message to anyone anywhere in the world. Uh, you weren't constrained by 140 characters. You could send rich media and that reduction in friction created uh, a dominant experience on the, the mobile platform. Uh, and that is what was the base experience, but uh, at Kick also saw the opportunity to start building a platform around that. So a web app platform um, 
you could uh, enable web developers to build what they were called cards. So it was these little mini web apps that could plug into Kick and people could interact uh, really simply and seamlessly with these web properties all in their uh, mobile phone and in their, their chat experience. Uh, so you mentioned you were an early Kick user. I was too. I started using Kick around 2011. And the, uh, the first experience that with that was I was actually doing an internship with Monster Energy. Uh, so Monster uh, up here in Canada had partnered with Coke for distribution. So Coke did all the distribution for Monster. And uh, when I joined Monster as an intern, we were doing all this coordination with uh, the Coke employees and they were all on Androids. We were on iPhones. So then the way that we all interacted was uh, through Kick. So that, that was our... Uh, predominant communication channel. And then a year later, I was uh, lining up. I went to a uh, school just down the street from uh, UW at a school called Laurier. thought I wanted to be an investment banker, so I landed up, up an internship to uh, do uh, investment banking in the summer down here in Toronto. But I tore my ACL playing football. Uh, so then I had to get a job in town in Waterloo because I was doing rehab. And the only jobs in Waterloo are insurance or software. Uh, and uh, specifically, uh, at the time, there were only a few consumer products, and that to me was the most exciting thing: building consumer products, not uh, you know insurance software. So I uh, saw that Kick was hiring for a role, and literally just said business. There was nothing else. Uh, so <laughs> I, I and I had used Kick a bunch, so I was like, yeah, I think this How is. How many employees were at Kick at that point? Um, there were. 10, 12 employees yeah. at the time. This is maybe two years post-launch. Yeah. Uh, so I get this internship at Kick uh, and never looked back. And yeah. right when I joined, we were starting to uh, think about how we can connect this. So at Kick at the time, there were hundreds of millions of users, uh, thousands of developers, publishers, and brands. Just blowing up. Yeah. Like all the graphs were up and to the right. It was yeah. awesome. Uh, and and we saw this opportunity to connect it all through payments. And that to us was like the missing piece. If we could connect all of these users and developers and brands uh, through payments, then you had uh, this little digital economy. And we had seen this starting to emerge in China with WeChat. And a fun anecdote about WeChat is they originally just had a desktop uh, chat app called QQ or Weishan. They saw Kick go viral and said, we need to build a an app just like that. So the first version of WeChat looked very similar to yeah. Kick. Uh, they both were green and had the very similar totally. structure. Yeah, yeah. even the aesthetic was very similar. Yeah. So we, we saw how in China, every, the o daily operating system for every person in China had very quickly become WeChat. If yeah. you want to send money to anyone, you do that through WeChat. You do all your banking through WeChat. If you want to get a mortgage, you do that through WeChat. And even if you just wanted to spend 10 cents on a sticker, uh, you would do that through WeChat. And we saw the opportunity to connect all of these people and all of these developers and brands and publishers through payments in this commerce layer. Uh, so we started working on that very early. Ted wrote this seminal blog post called The Race to Become the WeChat of the West in 2014. It was very prescient. It was before Facebook was doing uh, anything with payments or developers. No one had really even built a developer platform, let alone payments. So we spent the next few years working on this payments platform in Kick just through traditional financial rails. We were trying to plug into the credit card networks. We were talking to all the banks around the world, and we had some killer proof of concepts uh, that we had done. I remember one of them was we were working with Burger King and McDonald's to do this. Uh, you scan from the table, you place your order, and they'd bring the food right to the table. CEO of Burger King, I remember we did a pilot at one of their flagship stores in Miami. CEO of Burger King was there. He's like, this is amazing. We got to roll this out all over the country. Uh, but we kept getting blocked when we wanted to uh, roll out the payments uh, part of the product. And the main reason for that is just there's so much regulatory red tape. And the, the reason for that is because when you're doing anything with consumers' money and you're collecting a balance, you're regulated like a bank. And that makes sense because if you're controlling someone's balance, consumers are putting money in, and then you're running a database uh, to track everything – then you should be regulated like a bank. So to us, you know, we could partner with everyone, that, all these different regulated institutions, but they're just very slow uh, to work with, very slow to innovate. And we build consumer products. We want to move very quickly. We see opportunities on the Vanguard, and we want to build products around that and ship it really fast. And that is just 
the opposite of how financial institutions uh, operate. So the thing that got us excited about crypto was, I mean, the first sentence of the Bitcoin white paper, a purely peer-to-peer electronic cash system. And if you can give consumers full control of their own money, then you can build compelling consumer experiences. You can offer that to anyone anywhere in the world. You don't have to go country by country, region by region to find partners, uh, get them to agree to work with you, and then do all the compliance work around that. You can, if, if you can give consumers full control of their own money, then you can roll out a product to everyone all at once and you can innovate very quickly. Uh, so that's the thing that got us excited about crypto specifically. A bunch of us were into it personally for a while and then we saw, okay, this really is the only option to build a uh, compelling experience and connect all of these users, all of these developers, brands, and publishers through payments is with this, you know, what we now call self-custodial money. At the time, it wasn't even really called self-custodial or non-custodial money. It was just peer-to-peer cash. And that's what that's how people were talking about it back in 2014. And for people who are new to the space, uh, the you know, the self-custodial means that you have the seed phrase on your wallet. You control it mm-hmm. on your device. It's not held in a database anywhere from a company. It's like, I own these assets. Totally. And they're on my phone. Yeah, exactly. As a user, you have full control of your money. As you mentioned, there's a seed phrase. There's different ways that people yeah. can slice that and productize it. But at its core, you have your private key. And the seed phrase is a simple way to do it. Yeah. You do 12 words that represent that. And then as a developer, from the developer's perspective, uh, user generates that wallet. So they have full control of their uh, seed phrase. We don't know what that seed phrase is. So we cannot take users' funds. We can't block transactions. All we're really doing is allowing the user to access the underlying blockchain and be able to broadcast transactions to the network. And then that gives us a ton of flexibility to build the consumer experiences we want where the user has control of their money and then we're just creating opportunities for them to make payments. Of course. So Kit gets really excited about this around probably, I mean, Ted mentions back to 2013, but when did it really become something like a business um, objective that then led into Kin? Yeah, it was around 2015, 2016. One of our values as a company and has remained true for... um, well over a decade as we look at all the options. So in 2013, 2014, we're looking at all the different options with the payment rails that are available to us uh, as developers. You know, the, all the usual suspects were like, do we work with Stripe? Do we work with the banks? Do we work with the credit card processors? All of these different options. And at each step, we started to realize, okay, it's going to be constrained in this way. It's going to be constrained in this way. Are, is there another option that we don't have to compromise on the user experience? And that's really what guides us is can we deliver the most compelling user experience, reduce the friction as much as possible, and then also open up the aperture that developers all over the world can interact with this network. We don't have to say, okay, these peop- these users can use it. These users can't use it. If you're a developer, you can only use it with... Um, uh, these users in these specific regions, we want to have as wide an aperture as possible. And that's where we eventually landed. Okay, I, we think crypto is probably our only option to deliver a truly global experience uh, that you don't have to compromise on the user experience. So I'd say it was around 2015, 2016 that we started to narrow in, okay, if this is probably the option. And then 2016 was when we spent a ton of time, basically that whole year, I think it was around the end of 2015, early-ish 2016 is when we started going all in on building around crypto. And it was definitely not popular at that time. I think no. ETH was trading for like a dollar or two. It was yeah. not, there were no ICOs. There was like very little innovation happening in the space. Yeah, the Dow ICO would have happened around that uh, kind of 2016 timing. Um, but yeah, it was like, ETH was like nine bucks. You know, yeah. Nothing exciting going on. Exactly. So it was like 2016 is when we started to spend a bunch of time planning around this. And uh, 2017 is when we launched Ken. Uh, the The insight around Ken is we, we saw this uh, novel way to align incentives across a disparate group of people around the world in Bitcoin, where Bitcoin starts. There's a uh, simple way to uh, enable anyone to contribute to the network and then 
get rewarded for their contributions. And we thought that was very powerful. Now in Bitcoin, that was miners and people securing the network. But if we could run on top of a smart contract platform like Ethereum, where it has its own set of validators that are incentivized in a different way, then we could take the supply of CAN and uh, incentivize users and developers in a different way. So the initial insight with CAN is, okay, can we launch a currency uh, on top of a smart contract platform at the time that was Ethereum. And if we uh, can have the security underpinned by that underlying network at the time, Ethereum, uh, then we can take part of the supply and then incentivize developers to drive adoption of Kim. Uh, so we saw that as something that was powerful and impactful for uh, kick, but also a ton of other developers because we're recognizing it's harder and harder to create a sustainable business model that isn't adversarial to users. We didn't yeah. want to pollute the user experience with ads uh, or do anything extractive, uh, like take um, predatory fees on things. Uh, and we saw an opportunity now to align the incentives of users and developers through an underlying currency. And back in 2016, uh, for those that weren't there at the time, really the only thing you could do with crypto was send ETH or Bitcoin back and forth to your wallets. And there wasn't things like NFTs, DeFi didn't exist. Smart contracts was just a button in this wallet that you could click and do something with. So it was very kind of nascent, but everyone knew that this technology fundamentally might change the internet. Mm -hmm. And when I got really excited about what you guys were doing was, A, you're a Canadian company, but... Uh, it was the first real company that was took this seriously. Mm -hmm. And it kind of opened everyone's eye, a mind to like, hey, wow, like this may be a new kind of economy that we can create or a new uh, feature set to apps that no one's ever experienced before. Yeah. Uh, the I think one of the things that makes us as a team unique is that we – we got into crypto and I say like we, we came by it honestly, but it was through first principles of exploring all the different yeah. options. We realized, okay, we know the user experience we want to deliver. Uh, and the only way that we're able to do that is uh, with crypto as uh, the core of the uh, payments experience. Yeah. And so you, you know, that whole process was... A, amazing from the app side, because I remember I could send Kin between my apps, which was really amazing. Like mm -hmm. this currency that I can earn in one app, spend in another on something that I want. Uh, and it really was like, this is the first consumer version of what crypto could serve. Um, maybe talk a bit about like once Kin has launched that kind of timeline before you get to code of like what got, was getting you guys excited and you know that process wasn't always easy but maybe alluding a little bit to uh, kind of what you guys learned yeah so we launched kin in 2017 and really we launched it because we as kick wanted to participate in a broader payments network but we also knew a ton of other developers uh, who were in similar positions and yep. also knew that with this call it new option, there could be a bunch of new experiences yeah. that could emerge. There was like 50 apps using Kin at that time. Like looking at the dashboard, you could see, wow, 3 yeah. million people had earned Kin and, you know, a million people had spent it. That's pretty amazing. Totally. Yeah, it uh, it was cool. We we launched Kin not just for ourselves. We launched it for call it, the broader set yeah. of developers uh, in a way where we just – we were launching things that we wish already existed. And it wasn't opportunistic in the sense that we were trying to make a bunch of money off of yeah. it. It was, we see a gap of a integrated payments network that anyone in the world could tap into. Uh, yeah. So that's why we launched Can. There were dozens of developers, as you mentioned, uh, all over the world. They were, uh, I got to know a bunch of them and they were in a bunch of different countries. A lot of them would never have the opportunity as well to connect uh, to a payments network that they could then uh, service people from over 100 different countries. So that's the yeah. thing we were seeing is there's people in well over 100 countries, developers all over the world, uh, all seamlessly interacting. You could earn in one, spend in another. You could buy it. You could actually start using it. Those are all some of the exciting things. Uh, so we launched that in 2017. Um, it's a lot of initial success with adoption. Yeah. The technology uh, was probably the biggest challenge uh, because we launched on Ethereum. And Ethereum, uh, at the time, 
There were no L2s. There was no yeah. secondary scaling uh, options. So very quickly, we started to run into challenges. It was right around the time that CryptoKitties launched on Ethereum yeah. and basically took down the network. And it was only a 1,000 users using CryptoKitties. Totally, yeah. totally. And uh, we did the math. And if we if every kick, it, we'll put it this way, if we wanted to just airdrop one kin to every kick user at the time, we would have consumed the Ethereum network for like a year or something yeah. like that. So then very quickly we realized, okay, if we're going to hit scale, um, L2s are not here yet. There, And we could talk about some of the inherent challenges in L2s regardless, yeah. but just there, there were no other options. We said, okay, we need to find another option. So we uh, went to Stellar, which at the time Stellar was the next best option. It ran a federated model. So there was a lot more latitude on block size and hardware requirements because you could set very specific hardware requirements for Stellar, which then opened up more performance. But the underlying uh, Stellar client still had a bunch of constraints that didn't match what we needed. And I say we more broadly, like we as a group of developers. And I remember we'd do a bunch of calls. There's like dozens of developers on a call. Okay, what do we want to do technically to try and push this forward? Um, so we, uh, you know, I say, when I say we, it's a, a broad set of people that were all contributing to uh, ideation around just core technical. So then ultimately, uh, Fork Stellar, ran a Fork of Stellar for a bit. And then it was early 2019, I got to know Anatoly and Raj and the co-founders of Solana. Um, Ted and I did. And uh, I remember Anatoly was taking Ted and I through Solana on a whiteboard uh, in San Francisco. This is well before Testnet. And we started to realize, okay, there's some solid foundation here. And this theoretically, because at the time... And how did you find out about Solana? Did someone introduce you to them? Or did you just Google and find no, scalability we, in crypto and Solana popped up? No, it was actually, it was Kyle Samani from yeah. Multicoin uh, introed Ted to Anatoly uh, around early-ish 2019. And the Soul token didn't exist at this time. Soul token was launched more than a year later. Like Solana so was ex-Qualcomm engineers and they had some cell tower synchronization technology that they had worked on or something that allowed it to be really fast. Yeah, basically, I remember uh, hearing, because Ted had shared with me that Kyle uh, had mentioned that he was really excited about this team that he had just invested in, Solana. Yeah. So then uh, Ted and Anatoly got introed. I uh, got to know each other a bit there. And then as they started getting closer to, uh, they had kind of validated the idea of Solana. Okay, if we want to launch this network, that's when we started to spend a bit more time together because they wanted to learn from us, uh, but just about launching a token and yeah. some of the learnings are around that. And, and then through that, we just got to know a lot more about the core Solana um, developer experience. And I remember we were running local uh, builds of Solana literally on, laptops just to make sure it compiled and everything worked we realized okay there's enough technical foundation here uh that you could build a truly scalable global payments platform and then on the other side we're seeing that still no one has built this global payments platform that we really wish existed as kick uh, and as a developer and you know we made this this tough decision do we continue to build one consumer app or this thing that we wish existed for us and everyone else a, a seamless simple global payments platform doesn't exist yet uh we have the currency in can that we think is yeah. very important but you still need a platform that integrates with that and no one had built that yet so eventually you have an opportunity that stares you in the face long yeah. enough and we're also starting to see the opportunity is only increasing the uh friction to develop a new app is going down uh the uh, barrier to create content is going down and we're seeing more and more individual creators all over the internet. Uh, and I would say even in the last few years, that's accelerated even further with AI tools. You can generate images, oh, images audio, video, yeah, all this prompted. stuff. Like anyone can be a creator yeah. to us. That's really exciting. So we're seeing all this stuff starting to emerge and still no one's built this global payments platform that we yeah. wish existed. And eventually you're like, okay, we just, we have yeah. to build it. Like we can't just sit around and wait for someone else to do it. And we need to do it for you know ourselves yeah. and everyone else. And that's when we made the decision. Okay. Now's the time we'll sell kick and we'll go all in on building a new global payments platform with Solana as the uh, underpinning 
technology stack, and then Kin is yeah. the underlying currency on top of that. Uh, and really quick here, because this is very important. So Kin is actually the first project, I don't want to say the first SPL token, because I don't know, but the first project to migrate to Solana mm -hmm. for all the reasons that you mentioned. Yeah. And then Solana has gone on to become this huge, massive success. In hindsight, it's obvious that a, a low latency blockchain high throughput experience would be a cornerstone of the ecosystem. But back in 2019, that wasn't obvious yeah, to everyone, it was, it was except for you guys. It was incredibly contrarian. Yeah, um, yeah it was funny. It was the uh, fourth anniversary of the first Solana block a few weeks ago. And I went, I was like, I, I, I wanted to go through my email and figure out when we first started talking about migration of kin to Solana. This isn't even when we first started talking. And I found an email from, I think it was beginning of October, 2019. Wow. So that was a couple months before testnet went live of Solana and yeah. six months before mainnet went live. And there was an email with, uh, Anatoly, Ted and myself talking about, uh, proposing a migration of kin to Solana to the kin community. Yeah. Uh, so that was 2019. We spent a bunch of time cause we wrote the initial proposal to the kin community and it went through this whole democratic process of like, yep. okay, we looked at a bunch of options. We think kin collectively and all the developers that were contributing to it should all vote on where we move next because st we were capping out at stellar. Um, and, uh, so we started working on this proposal, uh, 20, October 2019, I think we put together the first proposal early 2020. This is still pre-Mainnet going live. Yeah. Uh, Pre-Soul Token still. Dutch yeah, well, well pre yeah. So, Soul Token. And then coordinated a call. There was like 50-ish independent yeah. developers. I was on that weekend. call. Yeah, yeah, that was a seminal moment as I we look back. That. But uh, yeah, went through that call, did a uh, stake-weighted vote. And then eventually the vote passed and that was still pre, I think that was still pre mainnet yeah. going live before there was even a soul token. Yeah. So we'll get to developing code in a minute, but, uh, you know, Kin migrated there and, you know, why, I guess in the app and we'll show the experience in a second, but you chose to use Kin, you didn't chose to use USD on Sol USDC on Solana or Sol on Solana, you chose to use Kin. Can you maybe walk through kind of, why can itself and you know what you know why code only uses that currency yeah um i get this question a lot and not stable coins why not stable coins yeah why don't we start there actually so why not stable it's coins? easier to answer why not stable coins yeah so why not stable coins um the thing that kicked off this entire movement was bitcoin and bitcoin really catalyzed its initial growth. And I would still say today, because of the ability for people to um, create and capture value by contributing to a network. And Tanner might not be able to say this, but I will say it. If Bitcoin was still a dollar and it only ever was a dollar, I don't think Tanner or I are sitting here or you listening to this are even are talking about this. Oh, I can say that. I've, I've for sure tweeted that before. Yeah, I, that I value creation. Back, I think I've had a bunch of back and yeah. forth on Twitter before of if Bitcoin was a stable coin, like it was just yeah. launched and it was pegged to the dollar, I don't think many people would have uh, gotten excited about it or really contributed to it. Yeah. The ability to be an early contributor to something and drive value of that network and then also capture value from your contributions is very powerful. And that's why we've seen strong communities build around Bitcoin. And now we've seen strong communities Helium, build, about, build a around of, a bunch yeah. of other uh, networks. Helium's yeah. a great example. They, they, they were able to bootstrap their network yeah. because uh, people could earn the HNT token yeah. by being an early contributor. I remember I, yeah. I bought one of the earliest... Uh, I don't even, it would be, well, hot they spots, call it a hotspot. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say it's like a Wi-Fi. The Laura router. Land hotspots. Exactly. Yeah. I have, yeah. I still have three of them. I deployed uh, like 250 of those. Did you? <laughs> yeah, holy, holy crap. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like the, the, the punchline is you can't build a community around a stable yeah. coin. Um, you can build a community around a floating currency. Yeah. We think that's incredibly powerful. We've seen that's what catalyzed the growth of Bitcoin and all of these networks is you start to have these communities that coalesce around them and then drive the adoption of that. And that to us is very powerful. Yeah. So then, okay, why not stablecoin? Why floating currency? 
I would say that the main argument is that you can build a community around that and that people can uh, both contribute and capture value uh, by participating in that community and that network. And then within all the floating currencies, why can? Uh, we're excited about can because it is fully distributed, fully decentralized, and it's through the regulatory gauntlet. Yeah. So I, I glossed over this before, but can was initially launched um, on Ethereum had an outstanding outstanding supply to incentivize developers. Punchline is after a bunch of years, you start to realize that's actually very difficult to do in a way yeah. that's not gameable. Um, so a decision was ultimately made to shut down the Kin Foundation and then burn all of the outstanding supply. So now yeah. circulating supply equals total supply for Kin. I would say that makes it probably one of, if not the most quote unquote decentralized currencies in the world. Cause there's no foundation driving, um, the adoption itself. There's no centralized entity doing that. It's just a, and no one controls the supply it, and what it is in the market exactly. and Certainly who supply owns equals what. total supply. Yeah. And you know, in DeFi, we learned this really quick that inflationary tokenomics structures don't work mm. at some point that does catch up. Uh, there are some projects that reach that critical mass where you can make it work. Like Solana Soul, to Soul Token does have like a 5% inflation and it works for them. Same with Bitcoin. But especially when you're trying to build in an ecosystem, you cannot have large chunks of the supply coming to the market and just, you know. Yeah, if it's, if it's not earned in a way that is a net value, creator, value creation... Yeah. Uh, and it's easily gameable, then that can be a tax on yeah. the system. And that that's why the decision was ultimately made. And it was a, again, community stake-weighted vote to burn the outstanding supply of kin. So now kin is fully distributed, fully decentralized. And as I, I mentioned, through the regulatory gauntlet, there was a full two-year process where um, we were going toe-to-toe -to -toe, um, with the SEC, I would say, on behalf of the industry. Um, and the... There, ended up with a positive settlement uh, at the end where basically the SEC said, okay, um, we didn't like how the initial token sale was done, but Kin today is not a security going forward. So there was a small fine paid and then um, Kin was able to move forward as a uh, non-security. And, and of course, everyone knows about the Ripple case, uh, but little well known is the Kin case that came long before it and, you know, kind of really pioneered that and I remember getting on the phone listening to the things and the phone lines being jammed up because you know thousands of people around the world wanted to know like hey can a uh, a network a decentralized network like this exist mm -hmm. and we were able to be part of deciding that in the core system yeah I, I would say it has been a fundamentally important thing for the industry even yes. at the time there were hundreds of other projects that were going through the same thing. They just weren't as public about it. And yeah. that's something that we always try to do is uh, be win-win and uh, try always try to find the win-win. And um, being public about it, we thought was important to um, be at the vanguard for the industry and try yeah. to get clarity. That's what we were we were pushing for. It was like, we just want some clarity. Totally. And that's why we, were, we went through that whole process. Because at the end of the day, technology is going to exist regardless. And mm -hmm. you just want to do it in a way that's responsible, but also recognize it's safe, all these kinds of things. And so finally, after, you know, eight years now, uh, we've started to get there, which is really exciting. Yeah. And I, I would also say the SEC and every regulator is in a tough spot where the new technology emerges, they're trying yeah. to wrap their arms around it. How do we regulate this? Yeah. And us being um, innovative, and we have a, uh, a history of being first on yeah. a lot of different things. Uh, we were one of the first out of the gate building yeah. a, a new network around a, a cryptocurrency. Um, so naturally, the regulators have to try and figure that out. And that's- They're in uh, a tough spot, but we're also eight years into this thing, and they should, should have, <laughs> have made some progress by now. Uh, but yeah, so- you burned out the outstanding supply. So there used to be 10 trillion tokens in circulation. Today, there's only 2.9 trillion or something like that. Uh, so it's a fixed supply asset. And like anything, you know, Bitcoin's early days, supply and demand. If more people want to own Bitcoin than is uh, in circulation or that's on an exchange, the supply will go up to accommodate those new buyers. And that happens with any market, whether you're trading gold or Bitcoin, it doesn't matter. 
and so the value creation system that's really at play here is as more people own kin or want it or need to use it to unlock an article, they have to go buy it. And that's natural supply and demand. Mm-hmm. And that's where value is created. Yeah, the the um the move to Solana back in twenty nineteen was indicative of the motivation of everyone that was contributing to Kin at the time because Solana was nascent, wasn't even launched. There were no traders there. So if you if you wanted to just optimize for trading, you would go back to Ethereum or you would go somewhere else. Solana had no community, um, like active trading community, I should say. There was a bunch of developers contributing to it uh, early but that's not the the place to go if your your goal is to just is to just drive speculation. We and all the other developers wanted to go to Solana because it was the best place to build consumer applications uh, because of its performance. And that remains true today. It's like we're trying to drive real demand. We're we're using Kin and Solana because we know the type of consumer experience we want to deliver and these are enablement tools to get there. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I was going to say in the early days, then SBF and Alameda entered the chat, but, you know, I won't, I digress. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Solana does does take off there. Uh, so why don't we show it? Because I think this yeah, is yeah. the best next thing we can do. So yeah, maybe actually before that, I'll give a bit more, even just color and clarity sure. on yeah. code. Like what is code? Code is a new global payments platform. As I mentioned, it's what we wish existed when we were building Kick. Uh, and we saw a, an opportunity to deliver a payments experience. And actually, Ted has this awesome line um, where we want to do to payments what chat apps did to SMS 15 years ago. And 15 years ago, as I mentioned at the top, uh, the messaging experience was incredibly constrained and uh, very regional. So if you wanted to send a message to... Someone, if they were on a different carrier, it was hard to do and you were constrained by 140 characters. Uh, and if you wanted to send a message to someone on a di- on, in a different country, it was even slower and more expensive. But then you roll out chat apps and now everyone in the world is connected uh, with roughly no constraints on the uh, user experience. You could send um, multi-paragraph messages, you could send rich media, and that started to open up uh, more connection you start to see businesses built on top of that uh, richer user experience and lower friction. And we see payments today uh, are still functioning much like SMS was 15 years ago, where the only uh, globally available payments API is hooking into credit cards. And with credit cards, you're really limited on who you can charge from. Uh, if you're a developer, you have to go through a whole know your business process. So indie developers or um, solo creators are kind of constrained on their ability to tap into these networks. And then even if you get past that gate, you're the only thing you can really do is charge people $5 or more. And there's a massive amount of, uh, I would call it deadweight loss of creators all over the world that aren't able to monetize because if you have to charge $5 or more, then that creates a, uh, a high barrier for payment. Someone has to say, okay, yeah, I do want to pay $5 or more. That's why you see most things end up coalescing around subscription models because you put in your credit card and you just, just get charged over and over. So you can't pay for things individually. But then also there's a ton of people creating things that are worth, I don't know, maybe $3 or $2 How or I would pay. How big do you think this market is? Because this has never been done before. And like, can aside, just yeah, yeah. micropayments in general, like this seems like it could be in the multi hundreds of billions of dollars in transaction value that's not being served because of all the friction you just described. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to even size that market because there's so much of it that has just been on the sidelines. There's so many things that are just being offered for free or people just have never built it because the friction is so high to monetize. So it's really tough to know. And it seems like it's growing at a, an increasingly, rapid rate with the creator tools that are available yeah. and people are more and more connected than ever before. So now you have this globally connected society where most of the world 
now has at minimum a smartphone. So they have a dominant personal computing device. And most people have, uh, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of people have multi devices. And then you have all these different creator tools for images, sound, video, and then distribution. The friction for distribution is so yeah. much lower, uh, but no one really is monetizing that today. Or I should say it's not no one, but a very small percentage follows of power law. There's like, you use writers as an example. People write all the time. They blog or even they're writing on Twitter and they're writing small insights. You know, I would even say like tweets and longer form tweets is a great example of content, but only 1% of writers around the world are monetizing because the only way to monetize is through something like a Substack or a Medium where someone has to sign up for at minimum $5 a month. So then you have all these people that are creating maybe one blog post here and there. Uh, and then the other thing that's actually not talked about as much is if you do subscriptions, if you're a creator and you're doing subscriptions, now you're locked in. That becomes a business where you have to deliver at a regular cadence because if someone's subscribing, then yeah. you have a- Versus an on-article, by-article basis. Exactly. There's yeah. so many people, myself included, that- you know, I get inspiration and I write about something and then two months goes by and I haven't written about something. And then all of a sudden I have an insight and I want to write about it. And I write three posts in the span of a month, but yeah. then I, I drop off. And if we can do individual micro payments, it starts to unlock a lot more economic, yeah. economic opportunity on the internet. Yeah. And so if you're listening to anything, the last five minutes of what Tanner's described is this really big opportunity that the tools you're about to see are going to address. And I, you know, I was on a spaces earlier today where I was talking about, and the question was like, how do we get normal people to accept crypto? And I was like, well, you got to solve real problems. Mm -hmm. And this is the number one real problem on the internet is like, if I want to pay five cents for an image or just read an article someone sent to me and it's paywall gated, like it's the most frustrating thing and billions of people have experienced this. And that's what this is going after. Totally. And that's a big industry. Yeah, it's been and it's been talked it's about huge for problem. decades. Yes. Mark Andreessen talks about when he was writing the uh, the first um, Netscape browser, wanted to do micropayments, and they just didn't get it in. And then Paul Graham wrote an essay about this. I want to say it was like 20 years ago. Chris Dixon's been talking about it for well over a decade. And the challenge has been mic like micropayments have not really been tried because the only payments rails are all running through credit cards or debit cards. And then the ch so the biggest challenge with this, it, it, there is a fundamental technical constraint. It's not like everyone around the world is just like, no, we just don't want to do micropayments. Because I think everyone, I shouldn't say everyone, but a lot of people see this as a big opportunity. The reason it has not been tried at scale comes all the way back to this idea of like self-custodial money. And that's what uh, crypto uniquely unlocks because if you're using cards, then you have a, a chargeback risk. If you're going to try, if you're going to accept credit card payments, then there's a risk that someone calls says, actually, no, I didn't make that payment. And then you have that payment rolled back. Same thing applies with debit cards or any type of card. Uh, and then what that means is that all the card processors have to build in a buffer to cover the risk of chargeback and all the anti-fraud apparatus because you have to build these massive businesses to do all of these types of payments to mitigate fraud. And then what that means is it pushes up the minimum payment because you, you have to, as a credit card or card processor or financial institution, build in a buffer for all the slippage of, of fraud. But when you deal with crypto, everything's atomic. I send you money, you have it instantly. There's no concept of chargeback. And that's what allows you to then do it uh, do micropayments because there isn't that chargeback risk. And then what the thing I would even just put a little bit further is then with crypto, you then have to have it running on very cheap infrastructure. And that's where Solana comes in because on Solana, then you can actually do a payment for sub one penny. And that's what makes it uh, scalable because you couldn't do this with Bitcoin. No. It's a $30 transaction fee, you know, exactly. layer two Ethereum, a few cents, Solana, a thousandth of a cent. Uh, and we'll, we'll actually show a video. We'll clip to a video here where uh, Tanner is moving the cash on code back and forth to each other. Uh, <laughs> and it's kin that's moving in the background, but it's being settled in dollars on your screen. And so actually to the user, when you open code up, which is this app here, you, you first start with a QR scanner. And I'll link to uh, everyone where they can download this. But you get this QR scanner, just a scanner in general. And... There's not really, you don't see crypto anywhere. When you download another, other crypto wallets, like it's really challenging. It's like these seed phrase things, the private key, public key. It's just, people have a really hard time with it, but this is really clean. It's literally just 
you know, the scanner. And uh, why don't uh, you give me some some money? And so what Tanner's doing is he'll put like $5 CAD in his uh, code app, and he'll load that up as a digital dollar bill. I was going to give you $2. $2, no, all right. <laughs> Since you asked for it, I'll give you he's five. He's too cheap, <laughs> no. guys. He's too cheap. <laughs> no, you're being predatory. <laughs> uh, a little a little, a little, forceful in the podcast. Um <laughs> Yeah, yeah I mean, you, so I mean, just the, uh, the I thought you teed that up really well. Um, but you ought to put load it up. You actually yeah, well, got to get it. He's holding out on me. <laughs> the basic experience around this, and we'll show a few things, but yeah. we want the this is the first experience that you launched yeah, a year ago. Exactly. The simplest analogy for money is cash. You go yeah. anywhere in the world, people understand cash. That's the first thing we launched is digital paper cash, the ability to load up any amount of money in any. Um, nominal fiat currency. So here I'll do, I'll choose $5 CAD. Often I'm doing US dollars, but I'll load up $5 Canadian uh, in this digital paper cash bill. And show everyone on this camera here. That so there, you, there's the digital paper bill. Here's my scanner. So I'm going to go and scan it. There you go. And instantly on my phone. And what's really cool is when you get that digital dollar bill, so I'll go put it in my wallet, is the phone vibrates. So you get this really nice haptic feedback that makes you feel like you're, you know. Yeah, we, money we spent a ton of time dialing in that yeah. animation of just like, what, what does it look like when it's coming off the screen, coming on the screen to make it yeah. feel as physical as possible? So it's great. I have my balances here. I can see, um, you know, that transaction happen. Now, all that is happening on chain which is really exciting. I'm in control of my own keys, as we explained earlier. And then code is also not just a wallet app, but under the hood, it's a bit of a layer two on Solana that's kind of teeing up transactions and allowing them to happen really quickly. And yeah. you're the first team to do that. Yeah, and similar to, I mean, really how everything's built, it's from first principles. We didn't set out to build a layer, a layer two on Solana. We started building on Solana and, it's great. It's performant. We still think it's the best development environment in crypto, but there's still rough edges. Sometimes yeah. uh, transactions get skipped. Uh, and that's why if you use um, Phantom, yeah, Phantom, if you use Phantom, you try to do a Jupiter swap. Sometimes you'll, you'll tap swap and then I'll spin, spin, spin. Oh, transaction failed to retry. Yeah. Uh, but we can't have retries. If you're dealing with people's money, you try to hand someone cash and it's like, you're trying to grab it and it's not coming off yeah. the screen. So you, awkward that moment. <laughs> exactly. It needs to be as instant, instant as cash. Yes. And that that's why we started building all this uh, infrastructure on top yeah. of Solana. So we built our own sequencer. We built a time lock program to guarantee funds availability. And we're borrowing from different concepts, but a lot of this was new novel concepts. And what ended up piecing together, because the other thing I would say um, that's important and we think is, uh, cash is a perfect metaphor, uh, and it's a perfect uh, set of constraints for us to set on ourselves that uh, if we're going to do this digital paper cash experience, it needs to have all the properties of cash. It needs yeah. to be instant. It needs to be reliable. You should never worry if that's going to work or not. You should never grab it. And it's like, oh, actually, no, that didn't work, and then the cash disappears. That would never happen in real life. I hand you a bill, you grab it, and then you have it. But then the other thing is cash is private. Yeah. If I hand you a $5 bill in real life, by you taking that bill, you don't then get to see my balance and my transaction history. Yeah. Oh, Tanner has five thousand dollars in his wallet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's it, and like I can on Ethereum, where I look up your address exactly. or on Solana. If I, look if I up send your you address. this on yeah. on Phantom or just Trust go to wallet, Soul Scan, then yeah. you just exactly you yeah. go through. You're like, oh, this is what Tanner yeah. owns. This is all the people he's yeah. transacted with. So we need a basic degree of yeah. privacy. And and how do you do that? Because it's a really novel concept. Yeah, how I'll. Do I'll, get, I'll use an analogy, and our team is awesome at coming up with real-world analogies for basically everything, and it's, it makes it really simple for us to conceptualize how we want to build things, and then it's also very easy to explain. So the, the best way I would explain it is, uh, and this was come up by with um, the guy who designed this privacy system. A bunch of us contributed to it, but I would say he was um, the one really designing most, most of it is this idea of like monopoly trace. So your ba your wallet is actually a set of accounts that all transact in strict denominations. So just like if you were playing Monopoly, you've got like your ones, your fives, your tens, blah, 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 all the way up with uh, your 
code wallet and anyone's is the same when your account gets created you actually have a bunch of we call them buckets but they're like monopoly trays and when i'm making a payment to you it's actually pulling from all of those trays in strict denominations but then it doesn't go straight to you what actually happens and this is getting uh into the weeds a little bit more is on solana there's no concept of a mempool so if you know like ethereum and and bitcoin there's a concept of a mempool where you submit a transaction it sits there uh, until it gets picked up on the network. But on Solana, there's no concept of a mempool, so that's why you'll have these failed transactions you have to retry. But on Solana, it does have a concept of something called the durable nonce. And then a durable nonce is the ability to, uh, and this is getting a bit technical, on Solana, you append the recent block hash in a transaction when you submit it to the Solana network. Instead of appending uh, a recent block hash, you can append a durable nonce. And for all intents and purposes, it kind of mimics a mempool in the sense that you have retry logic uh, on that transaction so that you could retry that transaction. And because it, it's signed by the user, it's like a valid signed transaction, but then it can be retried in the future. So what happens is all these transactions, uh, so if I want to make a payment to you, it's actually pulling from all these different, we'll call them trays. Um, we call them buckets internally, but these monopoly trays, it pulls from all of those and they all have uh, a durable nonce appended to it. So then it can actually sit there in the sequencer and then that can get played out on chain um, through the code sequencer. So then what actually ends up happening is we I've uh, constructed this payment. It's got actually a bunch of different transactions that I'll make that up. But then there's also a bunch of other people transacting on code. And then what we're able to do is you have all these signed, we'll call them like signed checks as the analogy, but it's a, a signed transaction with a durable non so it could get played out in the future. And what what is actually happening is say I want to pay you, but then Alice has wanted to pay Bob. Um, Parts of this uh, amalgamated payment could actually go to Bob and then part of Alice's payment could go to you. That's so so cool. then you can you can uh, sequence all of these transactions to make sure, and this is where the time lock program comes into play, is uh, all the wallets are smart, con- smart contract based wallets or accounts. So then it guarantees funds availability. Uh, funds availability, like two two words, but the availability of funds that you're, you actually have the amount so there's no double spend. So the smart contract guarantees the funds are there and then the sequencer can play out these transactions and actually take some of Alice's payments, send it to you, some of mine, send it to Bob, and then you can extrapolate that out even further. Yeah. So it's really privacy through obfuscation and that's what we're trying to go for is it's it's a practical approach to privacy. Yeah. That's what we call it, practical and Back to privacy. the Monopoly example, like if I paid you in Monopoly and I sent you $100 because I landed on your property, I might have to send, you know, three twenties, um, four fives, and I don't know where that leads me. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, some ones and you know some tens, right? So it's just sending a bunch of other smaller transactions that you know when you look on chain, you don't see that lump sum for that dollar twenty nine, that kind of specific number. Exactly. It's, yeah, that's pretty amazing. Um, I absolutely think that's incredible. It is incredible. No one's done. Yeah, that that we haven't seen anything. We talk, we often, because so the other thing, code is fully open source. Everything we yeah, we're gonna make a note that this is all open source as well, and we will link to that information so any developers out there can find that as well. Yeah, and we like we put everything we build, we put open source, but we also spend a ton of time just sharing our insights and things that we're thinking about building. That's one of the things that's awesome about the Solana community is. I'm connected, and the team is, to tons of other independent developers uh, building their own apps, people that work on the core Solana client, and everyone's sharing insights, and it's like, okay, we want to solve a specific problem. Let's just get a bunch of minds together and work on that, and that's what we try to do with everything we build. Yeah. All right, so we did the peer-to-peer sending the the digital paper cash. That was the first interaction came out a year ago. Can you send me a cash link? Because sure. this is the coolest part of the Kin community is there's a Telegram group uh, called Kin Cryptocurrency founded by Kinships. Shout out Kinships, you're a legend. Uh, but in this group, people are constantly posting these cash links, which are essentially sending the digital paper uh, bill, but as a link through WhatsApp, Telegram, on Facebook Messenger, whatever you want to do. It's just sending it as a link. Totally. So this time I'll send you, so in code two, I go give kin yep. and I can pick any currency in the world. So I'm going to, I'll send you 50 Brazilian real. This I time. love it. Yes. And again, what 
Code is doing is saying, what is the equivalent of 50 Brazilian real in Kin? Because a Kin has a market price that you see on screen now. And then it's sending that denomination a Kin. Cool. Plus so a small one cent fee, right? Or not, not on, on cash peer, links. Not no, on cash no, links. No, okay. peer to peer is full is completely free. There's no, okay. so I send you 500 Brazilian real, you get 500 Brazilian yeah. real or 50 in this case. Got it. Um, okay, so I'm going to send you 50 Brazilian real of can. I'll send it to you in Telegram. Yes, please. And so what I'm going to do is pull this up. Um, I think you sent this to my Telegram. Can you send it to uh, the producers? Our, our producers. <laughs> yeah, we won't dox his name. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'll send it. I'll send it there. Uh, I, although I think this was the first actually one we wanted to show. So we'll show it both on my phone. So here is where Tanner's message is. I click it. It opens up. Someone wants to send you cash, which is this really cool dollar bill there. I go click collect. And then you can go get the, uh, the code wallet. I already have it. It pulls it into the code wallet just like that. And all I do is click put in my wallet. Very simple. Again, happening go. on chain. Now we're going to show that uh, on screen here. Yeah. So all this time I'll send, I'll send um, five British pounds. So I picked a different. Well, we're balling out here a little <laughs> bit, eh? <laughs> Don't know what that is in CAD, but it's more than fifty cents. Cool. All right. I'm just sending you a cash link. So cash links on screen. Beautiful dollar bill for any Canadians out there, anyone who doesn't know our currency. We have this really nice translucent kind of looking money. So uh, I think there's some inspiration there. Um, so there you can see the equivalent. I just pull on my screen and what's <laughs> this is incredible. Like it pulls it off the screen onto your phone. It also vibrates, put in my wallet and I just, I'm balling out with five extra dollars. And again, Go to, you know, your transaction history. You can see all the transactions there. Um, that's a, cash link's really cool. So I'll link the Kin Cryptocurrency Telegram group. Join that community and go try and grab some cash links in there and you'll really kind of yeah, we've, experience it. We've seen cash links used in a lot of creative ways. The Telegram's been awesome where people are sharing them randomly in there. Someone joins like, hey, here's some cash so you can get started. But also uh, we see it all over the internet where people are, um, tipping each other for advice they get online, uh, doing little gifts. And this is a an interaction we've seen. Even one of the most popular things that happens in WeChat is this idea of red, red envelopes where they can load up, you can load up a little bit of money and send it to someone. And we're starting to see that happen now on any platform. That's the cool thing is with yeah. code and these cash links, you don't, uh, you can share it in, um, any messenger on any social platform, when you generate a cash link, you hit send or share and it pulls up the share sheet and you could post it on Twitter. You could send it a direct message. You could send it a group. And then the other cool thing is because of the privacy layer, you could post this online. I've posted tons of cash links on Twitter, um, just giving it away and people can collect that. And I don't have to have any fear of people then going through and then doxing me or figuring out yeah. what my balance is. Yeah. And uh, so we'll link Tanner's Twitter, obviously, but I've started to see people recently like gifting coffees to each other yeah, yeah. and then posting it online. Uh, that's really cool. Now we want to show, so cash links, uh, or sorry, peer-to-peer uh, -peer cash links. Uh, now we get to the area that's really exciting where about six months ago, four months ago, you guys demoed out the pay with code button, mm -hmm. which is really cool. You know, go to an article, it's gated, click it, opens up. But now you've created a version that, because that required a developer to input the code into HTML and enable that on their website. But mm -hmm. now you've created a version uh, that is a blogging tool. Do you want to share that? Yeah. So bit of context, as you shared, the peer-to-peer -peer experience was the first thing that we launched. And that was the fastest path to market because yeah. we could enable anyone to hand money to each other, send money to each other. Uh, and that got us in the game a lot of statistics, technology requirements, uh, and also just get it in people's hands. But the, I did a lot of onboarding for that. Yeah, that you was did, fun. and that was helpful. Yeah. Uh, but we we see a, a big opportunity, as I mentioned at the top, with this new global payments platform to enable anyone to uh, charge as little as five cents for something. And that unlocks a ton of new business models uh, for creating content, uh, developing uh, new apps and new experiences. So we launched the set of developer tools, the code SDK uh, in the fall. 
and we've seen over a thousand developers download that package, start launching things. Uh, I know you've been a part of a project yep. doing a virtual arcade, and yep. I see people tweeting about that. All We're the, the time. first micropayments arcade in the world. Heck yeah! So essentially, what we did <laughs> is just gate some games for twenty five cents, and so when you click to start the game, uh, it I, I might actually be able to show it real quick. Let's do this live. Uh, Sector ninety seven arcade. Uh, dot com. Maybe I have to direct link it here. All right. Well, there's my uh, Twitter talking about it. I'm just going to copy this into the browser. Not a uh, Apple user. But uh, so here's some games that we created in the arcade. As you can see, you're the old dark room arcade vibe in the background. You enter, it's a little musty arcade, <laughs> you know, a bit sweaty maybe. So here's you kind of into the arcade machine and we have this code button. Everyone remembers the insert token, the 25 cents per play. You know, it hit the uh, the code button. It opens up that uh, receipt there that I scan with my phone. Again, scanned it, swipe to pay, and now it unlocks the game. And I'm going to be, you know, horrible at uh, doing this, but, and I don't know, forget, yeah. <laughs> Not very good, but if you click log in, you can actually then register also to be on the leaderboard, and we have a leaderboard, and recently people have been playing that and trying to beat each other's high score. But as a developer, I go to my balances, and I wake up um, yesterday morning, and I had probably 100 payments for 25 cents. And overnight, I had made 25 bucks just because all these code users started trying to compete with each other on yeah. the arcade. Yeah, and that's those are the types of new and exciting experiences that are unlocked because as a game yeah. developer and you could speak to this your options previously would have been just give the game away for free and then maybe you monetize by putting some banner ads on the site which is annoying for you and annoying for users or you bulk you bulk sell a bunch of game credits and then people have to get their credit card they have to decide okay yeah i do actually want to buy ten dollars worth of game credits which is a pretty high barrier but with this now people can just pay for individual gameplay and it unlocks a new business model for you as a game developer and we see that uh, can be applied across a bunch of different verticals like another one that i'm personally excited about we've seen some early experimentation with this is uh, people that are hooking into um some of the AI generated image models, so Dolly or Stable Diffusion. And if you build your own interface for that, I think it's like five cent co server cost to generate an image. But what most people are doing, like if you try to go to Stable Diffusion or Mid Journey today, you got to sign up for a subscription. It's like 20 bucks a month, and then you get unlimited access to all these images. But what if I just want to pay for one or two images? And I run into this all the time where it's every few weeks, I'm like, oh yeah, I actually wish I had a few. AI generated images for this blog post or something like that. And I'm, I don't want to spend 20 bucks for yeah. this membership, but now people are able to plug into their open source tools, cover their costs and make money by charging 50 cents for an uh, AI generated image. And those yeah. are the types of new business models that are unlocked. One that we as a team are personally excited about is writing uh, a bunch of us on the team have been, uh, you know, semi-frequent bloggers in the past. We like writing. We also know a ton of writers and to us. It's one of the, easiest um, form factors to understand for consumers around micropayments because it's this consistent pain point of someone sends you an article, you scroll down, you, you read the first couple paragraphs, you start to get excited to that article and all of a sudden, boom, you get hit with a paywall. Okay, you got to sign up for a subscription, you got to uh, put your credit card in and then you're basically signed up for life. You ever want to unsubscribe, you have to like mm -hmm. go to their office and file a paper form to get a, um uh, get off of the uh, subscription. So Let's see if I can find, I just want to really hammer home how uh, annoying this is. I don't know if Business Insider here will just off the top show it. Uh, maybe they won't. But everyone knows you get an article sent like this to you. You can see about this much of it and then boom, paywall. Yeah. This is you know. still actually a good example because they're not doing paywalls, although I think they do it on some of their articles. But look at how many look ads. Look at the art. Like yeah, the scroll ads. down. It's like oh, you, you get one sentence, okay, ads. And then you get another sentence, ads. It's just like yeah. unreadable. Recipe, unreadable. Recipes are the worst. Because <laughs> like anyone who's- whole life story too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like recipes, it's like, oh, I designed this recipe with my, my grandma 100 years ago. And like then at the end, after you scrolled for five minutes and the page loads, you finally get, oh yeah, put it in the oven for three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but that's the thing, right? It's like <laughs> writing is the the business model around this is oh. is so taxing to the user yeah. and the writer. You talk to any writer. I know a bunch of professional writers that write for news publications and they hate it. No, <laughs> like they, they, they work so hard on this yeah. article and then there's just ads, 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 or they work so hard on this article and then they send it around and no one can read yeah. it because they have to subscribe. And, and then you see that on you know, Substack or Medium. Yeah. 99% of people that are writing on those and actually want to make money are not making money because they don't yeah. hit that subscription threshold. Or they don't have the traffic, exactly. right? Like if exactly. you're an indie writer, you have a thousand people subscribed, you're not generating enough money to make a living from it. Yeah. Um, okay, so <laughs> show us the way, Tanner. Yeah, so the, yeah, there's been over a thousand developers that have downloaded the SDK, started playing around with it. But we ourselves also want to dog food our own SDK yeah. to show the experience and also just go through it. We've continued to refine the SDK by building an app on top of it. So an app that we personally wanted to build was a, uh, my, a micro payments blogging platform where you can write a blog and we can automatically put a uh, micro paywall. We call, we call them internally micro paywalls. Basically, ability to charge 25 cents for an individual article. So I'll demo that for you here. I think I'm on the... So I actually, uh, really quick, do you have the version of the pay button? So I'm, I might uh, really quick send this to myself. And I'll just show... So this was released um, a couple of months ago. And I'll just pull this up. This was the first version. The backstory here, I remember Solana Toronto in November. I was literally the demo king onboarding people on the code. But here's exactly what we're talking about. So imagine this is Business Insider. You read that first thing. You're hooked. It's a little clickbaity. You're like, I want to read the rest. Or your friend sends it to you and you're like, you just fake that you read it because you can't afford the subscription. <laughs> but hey, here's this button to pay with code. Got my code app. Go scan this right here. Boom, pull it onto my phone. And Tanner, your developer got paid. I don't think you got paid on that. But if Tanner had created this article, you'd get a little notification like, oh, hey, here's 25 cents. But how much money, so talking numbers real quick, how much money has your developer made from just this demo article here? Because it's real money. Yeah, I haven't asked recently. I really should have given him my wallet address. <laughs> yeah, big mistake, yeah. but he was smart. Yeah, I, so I don't know, but it's, it, I mean, I asked a couple months ago, it, it was in the hundreds of dollars. And then the other thing is he he's getting paid in can. Yes. And the price of can has appreciated. Yeah, back to so this his actual chart here. Like, his, his actual earnings since yeah. he's been holding can. Yeah, I would I would not be surprised, and I, I don't want to um, misrepresent, but if that article has generated him over $1,000 in yeah. revenue at this point between all the payments and the appreciation. And this is where it gets really interesting because that's with just a few few thousand. How many code users are there? 10,000 code users? More than that. I don't know okay. the exact numbers. But in the tens of thousands of code users, you know what happens when an article uses this and it has a million visits, right? And yep. so instantly you have... It's really substantial earnings potential as writers, but also as the price of kin goes up, you know, me in my wallet, like there's one other dynamic I really love here. There's a balance at the top. And every time the price goes up, that balance grows. And so the purchasing power I have as a kin holder goes up as well. And so, you know, 25 cents, uh, you know, back when kin was down over here, is a, a lot less, you know, purchasing power than, or, you know, a lot less to spend than it is today. Whereas like 25 cents now is like whatever, right? Cause Kin's gone up in value. So mm. my purchasing power on this platform has gone up quite a bit. Totally. So it's right at the top. When you download it, you'll see your balance at the top. All right. We want to show the, the medium co uh, clone here. And again, like it just gets me so excited to see how big is this market? Like, is this a $1 trillion unsolved problem? Is it hundreds of billions? Like, we know this is a big problem on the internet. Mm -hmm. We don't know how big it is. Yeah, and I would I would say it'd be hard for anyone to really size really? it because so yeah. much of it is un. I think It's that you never could, happened you before. You could size a portion of it by what you'll be able to capture of some of the existing business models that are on the fringe. Yeah. But then there's just a ton of things that have never been built before that yeah. this unlocks a, a new viable business model. And that's what you you see at the advent of so much of the 
computing platforms we've seen today is new technology yeah. emerges and then a bunch of businesses get built around that that yeah. were never possible before. Yeah. So why don't you uh, tee up this article? Okay. And so I'll, I'll demo this. This is, so as uh, Josh mentioned, this is a, a blogging platform that we've built as a demonstration of the code SDK. I will caveat, it is a very simple app so far. That's what we're, we're platform developers. We also love building apps. So we built an app that we're, we think is elegant, but it is still quite simple. So I just want to set expectations around that as That's well. That's good. We, we need simple products in this industry. Yeah. So it's let refreshing. Me, let me share my screen here. All right. So Tanner's going to share screen. I'll navigate to that. And Tanner's going to give a demo here of, of creating an article. Cool. Okay. So we've got a uh, penny post. So the first, first step is to just uh, log in. So the login experience is actually quite simple. So you go log in with code. Everything comes back to uh, this concept of a, a scan code. So I can grab this login card off the screen. So, and so many people haven't seen the login card yet. No, this will probably be the first first one. Wow. Yeah. So we're this is the thing. When you build apps, uh, we get to dog food things. We're like, actually, it would be really nice to have a login experience. So this is it. This, this will is be why I'm good experience. friends with Tanner is because I get to see all this stuff early. Okay, so I swipe to log oh. in, and then it brings me right to the writing pad. So I'm, I'm not going to make you sit here and watch me write a whole post. So I'm going to pull up uh, a BitGet. Shout out BitGet. We're going to get you to do a, uh, an article here. So here's the BitGet newsletter. Um, I will just, I'm going to copy part of this. And so let's say you have a sub stack. You already have a medium. As a, uh, a writer, it wouldn't be that much lift to also just copy and paste your stuff into this as well. Yeah, you could easily cross post. <coughs> uh, and that's what I've been talking to a ton of writers who are excited about this. And that's what a bunch of them plan to do is take some of their existing content. Here, I'll copy over an image. To yeah, let's just, get that BitGet image in there. Just so we get the full experience. So we'll copy this image in there. So there's BitGet newsletter. Beautiful. So all the content is in there. And then it's just a simple. So as you saw, the login card is really simple. I'm just scanning to log in. The only thing that PennyPost, which is the name of the app here, uh, needs to know for login is what the public address is. Because it's where where is the money going to get sent when people make this payment? So it's a very simple login experience. So then you get right to the writing pad. You can pop that in. I'll go post. Are you ready to post? I hit publish. And now I have this link live. So I'll grab that link. And then here, I'll send it to you so that you can open it up on your I love how you have the post on X button there. Yeah, just to drive distribution. So All right. I'll send that to you, and then you can open that up on your side. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. All right, so here, I'm Tanner's fan. I follow Tanner on Twitter. Tanner published this new blog post. BitGet published this new blog uh, post. BitGet published this, but imagine, yeah, yeah. BitGet or Tanner. <laughs> And I want to read it. And uh, so right there, okay, so you have some of the article, but maybe you you know have some of it gated. Now, can you change the location of where that cuts off? Right now, it's there's just logic that puts it in okay. a specific spot. It's pretty easy configuration change. So, I mean, as a pen, as the, the developer here at PennyPost, we'll probably play around with this. But right now, we're starting with that positioning there. But if another developer wanted to integrate a similar format, it would be easy to configure that. Got it. So I want to read the rest of this article. Again, pay with code, swipe. So I'll show everyone. There it is on my phone. Swipe it. Then what? Instant, guys. And look at what? this. I just got, I literally just got paid. I just got He just got a notification. notification. He just got paid. And all this happened on chain, on Solana both in custody of our own keys, peer to peer. This is groundbreaking technology. This is incredible. Who is going to be using this in the coming months? Yeah, this has been exciting. Like we've we built this first as a demonstration of the SDK, and as this app started to come together, we we got more and more excited about it. And then I've been talking to a bunch of independent writers um, that span audience sizes, people that have we'll use just Twitter followers as an example, people that have hundreds or thousands of Twitter followers up to people that have millions of Twitter followers that are excited about this, want to play around with the app. Um, so we'll roll this out probably in the coming weeks. The There's there's three things. I'm going to zoom out just slightly and then we'll talk about Zoom out. I'll, I'll zoom out a little bit. 
Um, there's three things that were our, our top three priorities right now as a company uh, is one, launch an in-app, we call it buy module, but it's the ability to link a debit card and then buy more can directly in app. So that's step one. That is launching imminently. Any and each now. download, when people have it, they'll get a dollar, right? Yeah. yeah. Dollar for free, but then you can um, buy more can really simply with a debit yeah. card. It takes less than a minute. Uh, next thing is Android. So we'll roll out on Android. That also is very close to rolling out. And we want those two things to be live before Penny Post goes live. Because when Penny Post goes live, we want to make sure that if you're a writer, you have um, – Anyone in the world can interact with that content, whether they're an iOS or an Android user, and the ability for people to uh, add more funds to their wallet so that they can buy more articles, and that really completes the experience. So Penny Post, I mean, I just showed you a demo. It's not live yet, and we'll roll out the on-ramp and Android first, and then Penny Post. Uh, so I'll zoom back in on Penny Post. Uh, happy to come back to questions on Android and uh, the on-ramp I have a, couple. In a second here. But uh, yeah, the, the plan is to roll this out, get it in the hands of a bunch of writers and, uh, and then iterate. And that's uh, a demonstration of the SDK first and foremost. So we'll continue to use this with, uh, as a tool to onboard other developers and publishers, continue to have lots of good discussions uh, and sales, sales conversations, uh, BD uh, with publishers, who are uh, excited about the concept of micropayments and Penny Post is a tool for their writers to start testing this out. Um, so we see it uh, as a tool, but ultimately our goal is to not build a business around Penny Post ourselves, but to inspire people to build similar type products, inspire publishers to start integrating this natively. And then hopefully we see people build similar apps or do the same thing, but for videos or photos and start to inspire more and more. Of this is just blowing my mind. So I put out a, a tweet that asked for questions for Tanner and probably the number one was like when Android, but like spelt W E N yeah, of yeah. course. Uh, <laughs> so coming soon, do you have, can you give us a date? Can you give us a range? I, I honestly, I don't have a specific date just cause I'll, I'll put it this way. Like we'll roll it out as soon as, we're ready. And yeah, I'm doing it for the community. I know, I know. No, I'm but I'll, I'll, I'll give a bit more context. I'm not yeah. I'm not giving you a poli political non-answer. And by the way, I have the latest APK and Android build right here. It is nice. Yeah. It's so it's it's right at the final stages of like final polish. So I'd say we're week to week right now yeah. on Android. We want to roll out this on ramp before we roll out Android so that when people get Android, they have the on ramp. It's all there. It's yeah. all it's all right there. It's like that's the last big feature that we want to add to the app itself. So it would be nice if when people download Android for the first time, they have it already loaded. Um, so we're, I would say we're day to day right now on the on-ramp. By the time this publishes, the on-ramp might be live. The thing that's gating us is, um, so we work with a partner called Kato, uh, who powers all the card processing and fulfillment. K-O-T-O, right? K-A-D-O. K-A-D-O. Yeah. So they they power the on-ramp experience in code. And one of their partners that helps with fulfillment uh, needs to make a configuration change that just allows us to pass through a memo on a Solana transaction that then gives the device locale so then it can be expressed in their local currency. Right. So it's a very minor thing. We're waiting on them to flip that on and then we can roll out the on-ramp. So it might be live by the time this goes live. Uh, and then once that's live, Android will be a fast follow. We're doing final polish and design review, but it's getting very, very close. So I'd say we're week to week on that. Uh, and then Penny Post will likely follow. Oh my goodness. It's so exciting. Uh, so one of the other big questions that people have is the on-ramp. I mean, in an ideal world, every time someone spends or loads 25 bucks or a dollar into code, it's, it's buying it on, let's say, the open market. Uh, and again, that drives that kind of natural real world usage adoption that crypto has largely not had ever. Yep. And we're about to see this happen now. Um, maybe logistically, how do you look at that, you know, kind of purchase happening mechanically? Because everyone wants to know how that's going to yeah, happen. Yeah, this one's actually pretty exciting. Um, I think we're the first to be doing this. And the, the, way, the way it works is when a user adds their debit card. There's actually two steps. Um, first step is you, you're buying to the user. It says 
say you wanted to buy $25 of can, and I could actually just like show you what this looks like because I've got it on my build. So here it's, I want to buy $25 of can. I go next, and then that pulls me out to Kato. Um, I could sit here, and it would take me 45 seconds to do the demo, but we'll maybe do that hey, another time. Sounds good. Um, <laughs> But I, I go $25 of can, yeah. and then I tap confirm, and then it gets fulfilled. What's actually happening under the hood is Kado is taking my dollars, it's charging my debit card, and then it's fulfilling $25 of USDC. Yeah. But then that USDC is auto-flipped to kin on a DEX. So we have native DEX support yeah. uh, in... Jupiter? In, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, on Jupiter. Yeah. So we have Jupiter plugged into code, so then as soon as the USDC hits my code wallet, it flips to Kin. And then what that allows us to do is rather than rely on um, Kin sitting in some fulfillment wallet that just gets, because that's how most of this uh, these on-ramps work, is they have a bunch of USDC and then you buy it and then they just send it out. We want all of that to be happening open market, wow. like you said. So every purchase in code is actually hitting open market purchases on DEXs through Jupiter. I've been in the space for eight years, long time. He's been in the space for eight years. I've been following Kin since 2017. And this stuff is all really coming to a head here. Mm -hmm. And it's years of hard work, years of sometimes painful work, and years of saying, hey, nothing like this exists. And this is a massive, massive market. There is a huge unserved market here. Where, which could be in the size of hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars, which are micropayments on the internet. Mm -hmm. And maybe a, a tangent question to this is like with the rise of, let's say, AI and kind of automated things going on on the internet, like is there a world where AIs are using codes, some sort of code technology to send micropayments between each other? Like, I don't know, do you, do you see there's some automation on the internet that could use the tools that you're building? I mean, short answer is yes. The So one of the things that I'm most excited about with code is the team is phenomenal and has build, built a robust set of infrastructure all the way up to the application layer that allows us to build really quickly and iterate really quickly. Uh, and that's that allows us to move very fast. So you talk like the, the Jupiter integration, our team was able to do that in like less than a week. And, and that's because everything that is built on top of the code platform is done in a really elegant and robust way. And all the tools are available. So I, I, I'm backing up a little bit just to speak to the fact that we can move very quickly and the tools are very easy to build with. We've seen developers, and you can speak to this too, because you've built with the SDK. It's very simple to integrate easy. And, and integrate it into your native application or your web application. It was actually the easiest part of building Sector 97. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, that, that's And shout that's out the heat and Jules who did that work. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So the, the, the tools available are uh, incredibly simple to use, and a lot of work went into making that simple. But what that means is that the barrier to use them is very low. So people with very minimal development experiences can actually interact with the SDK natively. A friend of mine is not a developer. He's gotten pretty good with no code tools like Webflow and Framer. And he's been able to add uh, the code, uh, the pay with code button to his websites. And he would call himself not a developer. And it's that simple. So then when you talk about like AI, there's a lot of ways that these uh, models could use uh, code and the code infrastructure and can for these micropayments. We'll see how that ends up playing out. The, the intersection that I'm most excited about first with AI is just independent creators using AI tools to generate content and then be able to charge for those uh, with code. But over time, it'd be very simple to just stream payments. And yeah, because you're right. The thing with code, like Solana makes it very cheap and inexpensive. Uh, and then code makes it very simple to interact. Like the velocity of creating content is almost infinite now. Mm -hmm. You can create infinite amounts of content, create it quickly. Now you have a way to charge five cents for that. Uh, and then, so what are the other functionalities that you guys are thinking about? Uh, you talk about, you know, Ted's talked about two-way payments really quickly. What do you think about that? We, you just showed a login function, which is really cool. 
uh, and then streaming payments. Like maybe talk about a few of those other features that you guys are thinking about. Yeah, I mean, there's a huge backlog of things that we would love to build and eventually will build. It's all about prioritization. And totally. as a team and as a company, we just try to say, okay, what are our top three priorities? And yeah. we focus on those top three priorities. And as, as something ships, we move something up into the top three. So I shared our top three right now, which is OnRamp, Android, yeah, and Penny yeah. Post. After that, um, tipping is going to be pro- probably one of the next things that will slide into the top three and starting to build more of a product experience around tipping. We've seen organically that happening in the Telegram group and online with these cash links. So how can we productize that, make that even simpler? Uh, Two-way payments is something you had mentioned. So as a developer, uh, you could accept payment, but then you can also make payments. So you as an arcade developer, you could open up a tournament where everyone pays in to play a tournament. And then whoever wins gets paid out the pot. And that's something you don't have the ability to do with credit cards. So you could spin up a tournament and then trustlessly, because you don't have to take control of people's money. They could just go into smart contract and whoever wins, it gets paid out. So those are the types of things. We've also integrated a basic messaging protocol first to do push notifications. So then you as... Uh, again, an arcade developer, let's say you guys spin up a new title on your site. Anyone who's paid to play a game on Sector 97 before, you could send a push notification on-chain, so an on-chain message that hits uh, my device because I've, I've played on Sector 97. I could get a push notification, hey, we just launched a new game. Do you want to play it? So it's those types of re-engagement wow. tools, those types of uh, two-way payments unlocks a whole bunch of new use cases. Um like I said, starting to productize tipping a little bit more. We've got some really exciting ideas around that. Um, so, but it's all just a factor of prioritization. There's no shortage of ideas, and a lot of those ideas are built out of either insights that we've had as developers ourselves, or things that we see emerging in the market. Um, so that's that's a big part of our product development process is just understanding the types of opportunities we're seeing emerging, and then building a products around it. And that's one of the things that. The Kin community is also incredibly helpful with, and we come back to that question of stablecoin versus floating currency, and the fact that we have this community around Kin that is passionately engaged about code. Not only are they getting their friends to use it, which is great for driving adoption, we see a ton of usage, and that allows us to iterate on the product much quicker because people are using code, unlike a lot of other apps, and this is not a knock on any app, it's so hard to get people to just use your app, let alone share it. And the fact that people are using it consistently gives us a ton of good insight to iterate on the product. Yeah. And like Code and Kin have almost like nine lives. They've they've been around. You guys have gone through all this. In the Kin community, shout out to you guys who've stuck around. Well, I talk to a lot of people and they're like, yeah, you know, I was here in 2017. And that's a lot to be involved in it. But uh, it's, yeah, we've been there promoting it, talking about it as a community, helping people understand what it is, onboard users, it's a lot of things that companies pay a lot of money to do in terms of user acquisition that kind of gets pushed out to the community, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, it's uh, something we say often internally and um, in certain ways, say it externally too, is like we want everyone to be on the team. Yeah. And it's not when I say like on the team, not necessarily employees of code. That's the thing is like we're all on the Kin team together. We're contributors to the Kin ecosystem just the same way Everyone else is a contributor to the Kin ecosystem that is um, using Kin, is driving awareness, adoption with that. And then code is a tool for more and more people to contribute. And then the code SDK is an opportunity for more developers, creators, publishers, brands to all get on the Kin team together. So I wanted to pull a comparison up. And this is just research that I did personally, but uh, just in general, looking at like, you know, people talk about what what's a comparable application? So I, I think of Cash App kind of as a comparable. So Cash App or the parent company Block, which uh, is also a very crypto-friendly entity, they have a, a market cap of $50 billion. They have 51 million users. And I found a cool stat that the average deposit per month per user is 1000 bucks. And so Cash App has a slightly different use case. You know, people are using it kind of as a banking app or in Canada, we have Wealth Simple and a few others uh, around the world. But this kind of gives at least some sort of, um, you know, kind of barometer of like, if you really nail the experience, how many users could you have? How many downloads could be there? You know, if an article gets 100,000 visits, that could onboard, you know, potentially 50, you know, assuming like a, a 
50% bounce rate, like 50,000 users in one article and the network. So like the, the viral network effect here could be tremendous. And then what happens when, you know, a million users go buy $2 because they got to reload their code app. I mean, it's never, these numbers just start to look crazy of like where this goes. And I just, you know, again, not advice at all or financial advice, uh, but I just wanted to put that in context because that's data that we see in the real world. And I want people to know that mm. it's it's out there. Yeah, so. one, one thing I'll even speak to on that, um, there's a, a couple subtle diff. One's kind of subtle, and then one's a more pronounced difference between us and Cash. I do think it's a good analog. Um, one of the big differences, though, is Cash App is a custodial app, um, so they're regulated like a bank. And not only does that mean that their team has to be huge and they have a massive compliance department, but they're also constrained on the rate at which they can innovate around financial products, but they're also constrained geographically. Cash App is only available in the U.S., and that's yeah. something that – Often people in the U.S. don't recognize. They think that everyone uh, in the world has Cash App. But the reality is most people don't. And actually, a lot of the team that works on the Cash App and builds the Cash App lives in Kitchener in Canada. And they can't use their own app in their country because it's constrained just to the U.S. And when you deal, when you move to self-custodial crypto, that's the unique advantage of code is you can offer that product experience to anyone anywhere in the world outside of sanctioned countries of, of course, course. Yeah. uh and the, the thing that is actually really exciting about that is it's not when you add another country let's say us and let's say you took another their country of a comparable size um it's not n plus n it's n squared yeah. uh, in user adoption because you start to add that virality factor yeah by adding more and more markets so that's a big and maybe another analog is actually robux because i i work at a gaming studio we we do a lot with roblox uh robux is another analog they have uh six billion dollars that people use or buy robux for mm. which is you know the currency within roblox uh and if you added those users up every month that show up the platform you get to like the population of you know, nigeria it's a quite a significant or it'd be the seventh biggest country in the world wow. if roblox was a country you know six billion dollars in gdp which is the amount of money people buy Roblox. So it's just, the numbers get kind of interesting uh, when you work it out. And again, Roblox, or Roblox has done a good job of also microtransactions. You know, buying a, t a digital t-shirt for five cents uh, is totally a thing. And yeah. the parents are, you know, going to convenience stores buying it. Yeah. The the other difference that I would point out about Cash App and Code, and, and you said this, like people use Cash App like their banking app. An extension yeah. of their banking app. They get their paycheck some people just get their paycheck directly deposited into Cash App. That is not what Code Correct. is trying to be. Is not, to be not, clear. And it's a, like, Code is like cashing your wallet. And that's, yeah. like, the digital paper cash, again, presents itself as a, as a helpful narrative of the same way that you would take some money out of your bank account. You might carry it around in your wallet like cash. To spend for to spend, whatever. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's the way um, we see Code being used yeah. is like cashing your wallet. Yeah. So I, it, the, the balances will likely be smaller than Cash yeah. App because – it's not um, a venue to just dump your whole paycheck into. Yeah. Uh, and that's totally great. And you guys actually were very intentional of, of capping the amount you could use code for, for this exact reason, just moving slow, methodical around yeah. you know, safety and whatnot. Um, so you guys did a $6.5 million seed round. You have really impressive investors on that. Maybe just talk about, you know, what that round means for code itself, what you guys envision the resources for, but also kin as an ecosystem. Mm. Yeah, the we we're really fortunate to be working with some of the best investors in the world. Uh, so the seed round was uh, led by M13 and then USV uh, rounded out the round. And then we had a few um, prominent entrepreneurs also uh, contribute, uh, which has been great. It's people that we have known for a long time, have deep respect for, and we think can be uniquely strategic outside of just the the money invested. The money invested is an accelerant, and that's the way we view it. We were self-funded for over three years uh, with code. And, and that made sense at the time because we hadn't really launched anything. We were able to 
build in the quiet of the night. Uh, With a team of about 10, right? 10 to 15? Yeah, 10. 10? Yeah. Um, So we were self-funded for a while. And then once we came to market, we saw that was the opportunity to start accelerating. Uh, So bringing on additional capital and strategic investors um, has been really helpful. And we're very fortunate to be working with some of the best. Um, Latif at M13, who led uh, the the round uh, for M13, he's been great to work with, very well connected, and also um, just understands consumer product well. And uh, Fred Wilson from USV, We've worked with him for well Legendary over a decade. Investor. Yeah, he's he's early one of, Coinbase. One one of the best and is incredibly smart. Um, and, and again, just a fantastic partner. And then the others that uh, that contributed individually, um, we've worked with for for a long time and know them very well and see them as uniquely strategic as we uh, push forward. Yeah, very cool. Uh, so I think we're going to probably round out the podcast there. Um, did you have anything else that you think that you missed or might've wanted to add to this while we wrap it up? No, I would just say a thank you to all the code users, everyone in the kin community as well. Um, it has been a real joy to be building a product. We say just in the open, we try to be very transparent about what we're working on ship as fast as we can and we get a ton of good insights everyone's sharing great feedback uh sharing it with their friends and family which is also great because then we just get more people using uh the app and the platform and allows us to iterate uh quickly so just want to say a big thank you and just ask that everyone keep doing the same thing because it's uh it's a lot of fun to be building this this product in public and uh we're excited for the road ahead Awesome. So the links to download code will be in the description as well as the Kin Cryptocurrency Telegram group where you can join that, try and pick up some cash links. You got to be quick on getting those cash links because they go quick, Uh, but you can also just get information and uh, the latest news. I will link your Twitter so that uh, and codes Twitter so that as you guys have uh, people using penny posts, you'll retweet it so people will have an area where they can go and and use Kin and code um, to access those articles as well as you'll see Se- Sector 97 Arcade where you can uh, go play some games and uh, the open source information for code itself. I'll link that as well. Awesome. So all in the description. Use the get, bit get referral link as well. And yeah, we'll see you on the next podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me.